Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It is our first webinar in our accreditation webinar series in 2023, and it's all about Factor 10, keeping it simple in a complex world. I'm Seth Petrie, Director of Marketing for CQL, the Council on Quality and Leadership. I'm going to share just a few housekeeping items today before I toss things over to our presenters. All attendees are in listen-only mode, so you won't be able to speak with us during the webinar, but if you need to communicate with us, you can do that using the Q&A box. Uh, we have turned off the chat box for the webinar, but again, if you have any questions, concerns, technical issues, anything at all, please use that Q&A box. We will, however, be using the chat box to send uh, relevant links to various resources, tools, guides, um, other articles and everything that are related to uh, the topics that we'll be talking about today. Uh, beyond that, we will be devoting some time to questions and answers at the end of the webinar. So again, if as uh, Elizabeth and Jacqueline are presenting, please post those into the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, we have enabled Zoom's built-in live transcript uh, closed captioning service. If you need to enable that, you can click the control window on your uh, Zoom control bar and you can uh, view those. So now I'm gonna be handing things, oh, actually one more thing. Uh, we are recording today's session and as usual, we will be posting um, the recording and a PDF version of the PowerPoint slides to our website. We will be sending out an email to all registrants of this webinar, whether you actually attended or not, in roughly a week or two. So you'll get that email. It'll link you directly to where you can watch the recording, where you can download the PDF of the slides. And again, you'll receive that in roughly one to two weeks. So now uh, we'll get started with Factor 10, keeping it simple in a complex world. Our presenters today our Jacqueline Cooper, a Quality Enhancement Specialist at CQL, and Elizabeth Seitz, our Director of Organizational Excellence. Uh, Jacqueline and Elizabeth, I'll hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Seth. Uh, we are so excited to be here and welcome everyone. Um, like Seth said, my name is Elizabeth Seitz and Jackie and I are excited to present on our topic today, Factor 10 of the Basic Assurances. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can break it down a little bit to make it a little bit more meaningful and understandable to everyone. Now, it might be helpful if you have a basic assurances manual to have that with you and to open to page 42. Uh, 42, this page outlines the indicators and probes within factor 10. Jackie and I will be doing our very best to reference different probes um, as we move through the webinar. So as we're speaking to different concepts or ideas, uh, we will try to reference back to the specific probe um, that we are speaking to. Additionally, um, just to let everyone know in advance, there will be repetition of different key points throughout our time together today. We just really wanted to drive home some very important components um, of factor 10 because we know that this is a factor that um, it can be very confusing and, and cause a little anxiety amongst uh, all of us sometimes. So let's go ahead and get going. As we always like to do, we wanna start by sharing CQL's vision and mission. Our vision is a world of dignity, opportunity, and community for all people. Our mission is that we are dedicated to the definition, the measurement, and the improvement of personal quality of life. And that is a key component of our topic today. Um, learning how to define, to measure, and to improve personal quality of life at the individual level and the organizational level. Now, CQL has accredited more than 380 organizations. So as of right now, I think we're around 389 organizations that have achieved accreditation with CQL. That includes um, organizations throughout 23 states in the United States. Um, that includes the Tennessee Intellectual and Developmental Disability System and all provider organizations throughout North Dakota and South Dakota. Uh, we also um, have accredited organizations um, throughout Canada and in the country of Ireland. 
Now, there are many benefits to CQL accreditation, and Jackie and I could probably spend an entire webinar just speaking to those benefits. Uh, but just to share a few of them, these include, and most importantly, the positive impact on people and improved services. Other benefits, though, include external validation. So other people coming in and, and looking to seeing the great things that, um, that you're doing at your organization and where you can continue to move forward. Accountability for progress. We know our job is to keep you moving, keep you moving forward. Other benefits include strategic planning, helping you look to see where those opportunities lie and how you can keep moving forward. Alignment of values and resource sharing. We love to share resources as we find the, the examples of great things that are going on. Now, lastly, additional benefits include data, of course. That's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. QA and QE structure, also a key component of today's webinar, and personal outcome measures. Again, all of these which will be a part of today's discussion. Now, we want to get right into it, but first, really, what is factor 10? Well, we know that it's about monitoring the basic assurances, okay? But it's, it's, it's more than that, but not in a complex way, really. Ultimately, factor 10 is your integrated quality management system. It is how quality is managed throughout an organization. Now, ASQ, the American Society for Quality, defines a quality management system as a formalized system that documents processes, procedures, and responsibilities for achieving quality policies and objectives. A QMS helps coordinate and direct an organization's activities to meet customer and regulatory requirements, and improve its effectiveness and efficiency on a continuous basis. Now, there are some keywords and ideas that we really want to remember here. Okay. Um, number one, achieving objectives. Number two, customer. Number three, improve. And number four, continuous basis. Okay. So let's take a look at these four uh, key words or ideas. Number one, achieving objectives. Okay, what, what does that even mean? What it means is that we have to identify and define what the goals are that we're trying to achieve. Okay, so those have to be defined. We have to know what we're looking for and what we want to accomplish. Second is our customer. Okay, well, who is our customer? Okay, the customer is the person receiving the service. That is who the customer is, okay? Third idea is just the word improve, okay? Remember, this isn't just about maintaining, okay? Maintaining quality, it's about getting better. It's about continuous quality improvement. And number four, continuous basis. Like we just said, it's ongoing, it's continuous, it's not a one and done. Quality is, is not a one-time event, it is, it's ongoing. And that's, these are just some really important things that we need to remember as we think about factor 10 and our integrated quality management system. And I just love this graphic here. I think it, it, it's such a nice, just very simple graphic. Um, that talks about and shows kind of the ideas of an IQMS or integrated quality management system. No matter the size of your organization, an IQMS does not need to be complicated. Okay? A key component of any IQMS is data. And remember, data is information in whatever form you collect it. Simply the idea or the word data sometimes just scares people. It makes them nervous. Uh, we're not asking anybody to be statistical geniuses. Um, we're just asking to look at information. What is the data and the information that you collect? Uh, what, what is it telling you? Okay. 
your quality management system takes that information, okay? It puts it all together and it tells a story. In the end, it's about how the information is used to enact change. That goes back to the continuous quality improvement, okay? So when we talk about quality management, again, there are two components. There's the QA or the quality insurance, quality assurance, and then the QI, the quality of improvement. Okay. Both are important. They really are. Both are important. But the emphasis here that we want to remember of factor 10 really is on that continuous quality improvement. Okay. Probes that I want you to take a look at and kind of think about here are probes 10A6 and probes 10A13. Okay. Now, quality assurance, again, is just about ensuring that things are occurring. It's the maintenance of a desired level of quality in a service. Okay, just the maintenance. Now, maintenance is important, right? Um, so, QA is about that maintenance, and we can't lose that. It's still important. QI, or quality improvement, refers to how we systematically improve the ways that support is delivered to people. Okay. So the, just the, the differences there between the QA and the QI. Now, we can't forget about the integrated component of integrated quality management systems. Okay. So probe 10B10, it talks a little bit about um, the, the integrated component of um, factor 10. Uh, it's important because it's not just having about having a quality management system. It has to work together. It can't work in silos. Okay. And this concept is tied to, um, again, probe 10B10. What this is saying is that different departments, different services, different locations, all the pieces of an organization, no matter how big or small, have to work together for a common goal. Data and information does not stay within one department, service, or location. It might begin within one specific department, but it can't and shouldn't end there. So data or information that begins within one department or service or location must flow into a location where all the information lives. Okay. Uh, so here's just another way to look at it. Okay. Factor 10 is in the middle, right? Everything feeds into factor 10. Okay. Probe to keep an eye on here is probe 10 B. Seven, okay. Um, everything has to flow together. Um, another one that's really important is 10B10, okay? 10B10 is a really important probe here because 10B10 talks about the plan being coordinated and interrelated across the organization's various programs and departments around the flow of services and supports provided to people. So information from different factors may be looked at or reviewed or collected by a variety of different services, departments, committees, or locations. However, that's done for your organization, in order for the QMS to be integrated, somehow it must all flow together, okay? Into one group or committee that keeps an eye on everything. So while you might have a committee that does keep its eye on, you know, safety data, it can't live there only. It has to flow into an, the system where everything lives so that you can look at everything together. Okay. Um, again, depending on the size of your organization, depending on how you're structured, it's going to look different because there is no, you know, there's not one system. There's not one way of doing that. Okay, but there is, it is really important that there is some system for review of all the information and data together, kind of like the dashboard of a car. Okay, so when you think about the dashboard of a car, each part of that dashboard serves a function. 
Okay. And each is really, really important to the health of that car, but it cannot stand alone. Okay. To see the full health of the car, to see how all systems work together, you have to be able to see the entire dashboard. You have to see all the parts and how they're working together. Okay. And all this information must flow back and forth. Okay. So again, think about factor 10. Think about your quality management system as that dashboard of the car. All those little pieces on the dashboard are a different factor. It's different data and different components. Ultimately, though, you have to look at it all together to truly have an integrated quality management system. Okay. It can, the, the, the gas tank can't live on its own. You know, if we think of the gas tank as, you know, the HR department, it can't live on its own, okay? So it might monitor some things, but it needs to feed into the entire dashboard. So again, just to kind of recap, you know, factor 10 guides us on how to keep an eye on all the factors of the basic assurances in an integrated, cohesive manner. Okay. It, again, if you're a small service provider, it may all be done by just a couple of people on a less frequent basis. But if you're a large service provider, it might be done by multiple committees or groups, departments at more frequent intervals. Okay. It may be organized by one person or department to keep it all straight, but the whole goal is to keep it simple, efficient, and effective. Okay. So again, your IQMS or Factor 10 guides us on how, through data and information that you collect, to keep an eye on what's going on within the organization through the other nine factors. That's your framework. The other nine factors are the framework, framework for what, how you are looking at and what you are looking at. Okay. So the whole idea of this webinar is to keep it simple. Let's not overcomplicate it. So how do we do that? Well, Jackie is going to get us started by talking about the two indicators within Factor 10. Thank you, Liz. So within Factor 10, there are two main parts. One is the policy and the other is the plan. Um, with the first section of Factor 10, this is indicator 10A, the organization monitors basic assurances. This section gives details about what the policy should emphasize. Um, the policy contains the organization's strategies for monitoring the basic assurances. It outlines the overall framework for the organization, organization's integrated, um, integrated quality management system, which includes the monitoring of the basic assurances. The second section of Factor 10 is 10B, which references the comprehensive plan that details the methods and the procedures for monitoring and evaluating the basic assurances for people. Think of it as the who, what, when, and why of monitoring. Both the policy and the plan should always focus on the evaluation of support systems at both the individual and the organizational level. So now we're gonna, gonna analyze some of the components that make for a hardy policy, that 10A. Um, like Liz said, you can follow around, follow um, us along in your basic assurance manual. Um, you can follow along with some of the probes that I'll be highlighting. Um, the policy should identify leaders for developing and overseeing the design of the plan and for delegating and creating accountability among the team, which is from probe 10A2 and 10A3. One tip with this is during the development phase of the policy, when you're identifying the leaders, you may want to consider only including the person's position or their role and not specific names of people when identifying team members. 
so that you know that way if you, you don't have to worry about revising when people change positions or leave the organization from probe 10 a4 the policy should include a value statement that emphasizes the organization's commitment to maintain the presence of basic assurance outcomes over time. One question you may wanna ask when developing this value statement might be, why is the monitoring of basic assurances important for the organization and all the stakeholders? Your answer to the question will help form your value statement. For example, um, building communities incorporated is committed to maintaining the presence of basic assurance outcomes to enrich the lives of the people we support, providing the best workplace for our staff and building meaningful community partnerships. The policy should also, um, and I'm gonna be referencing probe 10A6 for this, emphasize continuous improvement and learning rather than responding reactively when problems arise. Remember, it's better to be proactive than reactive. There's so much that can be avoided if data is reviewed continuously. For example, you discover after analyzing the complaint log data that there's a trend of people that are not that are being that are dissatisfied with one particular staff member after talking with people you discover that the staff is being disrespectful to all the people they support after the investigation the staff is terminated with just cause because the organization analyzed that complaint information became aware of the trend and acted upon it they avoided potential future critical incidents that might take place in probe 10a7 the policy um, it also talks about how the, sh the policy should also include discussing the ways in which people and when i say people that is stakeholders people supported families and staff how they'll be informed and educated about the monitoring of basic assurances and solicited for their involvement in the evaluation process People need to understand their roles and responsibilities and buy into taking part of this process. For involvement, you might wanna ask, are people a part of any of the committees of your organization that monitor the basic assurances? This could include the quality or an incident committee. And then in what ways do you measure their satisfaction? Some examples include gathering satisfaction information of people supported and staff. And this can happen in a, many different ways, through surveys, through suggestion box, boxes, meetings, and the complaint and grievance data. The policy should also include probe 10A9, review the system for sharing the results with all stakeholders, which includes internal and external. What re and then talk about what relatable parts will you share? We'll dive into this a little bit more in detail and a little further down the road in the presentation. Remember, transparency is key. You want to share strengths and opportunities. Quality relies on both. You want to build on strengths to assist with the areas of opportunity. So now that we've talked a little bit about the components of the policy, let's discuss the second part of factor 10, which is the plan, which is 10B of the basic assurances. The plan should include the data sources. Think about ways in which you already collect data. And where does it come from? It can come from surveys, human rights committee meeting minutes, assessments, discovery tools, personal outcome measure interviews, complaint grievance logs, human resource reports, incident reporting. There are a multitude of sources. Next thing you'd want to include in your plan is the data collected. What specific information would you like to monitor within the data sources? Some examples of this include from surveys, you may want to collect data about the people's satisfaction with the specific staff that support them, 
Another example is taken from the Human Rights Committee meeting minutes, the number of rights restrictions reviewed and those that are lifted. You also want to include timelines and frequencies for data collection. How often will you collect the data and how often will you analyze it? There will be some data that might be advantageous to collect on a quarterly basis. And then there's some that might only be annually, depending on the size of the, the data collected. It's also important to break down who is responsible for collecting, analyzing, implementing action and leading the plan. Breaking down the accountability at each level is crucial. All levels are equally important. Each person plays an integral part in bringing all the puzzle pieces to the table for effective monitoring. Remember, everyone is responsible for quality. So, how do you put all the components together we just talked about into a plan format that works for your organizations? Organizations do this in a variety of ways. Some use a template form with the different columns for each section. Others might use an Excel spreadsheet that identifies all the components. And then other organizations utilize dashboards in their electronic record systems, like Elizabeth was talking about earlier. The plan format helps bring all the puzzle pieces together for an integrated quality management system that includes the monitoring of all the basic assurances. Now, Liz will dive a little deeper into some of the data puzzle pieces. Thanks, Jackie. I really just love this slide um, with all the puzzle pieces because that's one um, kind of the analogy that I often use when you think about factor 10. There's so many different pieces of it. And you think about each different factor, each different piece of data is a different piece of the puzzle. And it really becomes your integrated quality management system when all those puzzle pieces come together uh, to form the puzzle and the picture for what you can see. Um, this one too, um, with the goldfish, um, I really love this, uh, this slide as well. Um, you know, one of the best pieces of advice that we can give any organization, um, is to think big, but start small. Okay. You don't want to, you don't want to go too big. It's like buying your first home. You don't want to go too big. You want to start small. We often have heard that term starter home, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. It's our starter system, okay? As you develop your integrated quality management system, it will start one way. It will start small, and it should start small. And then over time, it will start to mature. It will look more sophisticated. You might go from, you know, Word documents to dashboards. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do it, um, to how you put it together. Um, but the important component is that it, it's, it's all together and it's integrated. Now, the first time I developed a, a basic assurances monitoring system, it was very, very basic. Um, as a provider, we look mostly at regulatory data and use, you know, Word docs uh, for a lot of things. Um, but you know what? It worked at the time. Okay. And over time, we started to see the different types of data that we wanted to look at. Uh, we found more efficient ways to gather the data and then started to learn how to really analyze the information and challenge ourselves. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It took years, but that was the important part, is that we kept it moving forward. It was living and breathing, and we were always thinking about that bigger fishbowl that we wanted to get to. Now, for this slide, we're going to focus on a, a few different topics, um, specifically when we're looking at probes uh, 10A14, 10B2 and 3, and 10B8, okay? Um, the first thing that you really have to do is identify relevant, meaningful data, okay? You, you, this is your why. This is the why are we collecting what we collect. This is the why is this important to us, okay? And hopefully that includes POM data, okay? 
But another important piece of advice that we can give you is do not collect data just to collect data, just to say that you, you are collecting data and looking at it. The data that you collect, the information that you pull together must be relevant and meaningful to you and to your organization and to the people that you support. Remember, you know, accredited organizations with Portal, you have POM data at your fingertips. So you already have an electronic way, um, a really nice way system of, of collecting and, and um, looking at POM data and running reports. So remember, Portal is there for you. Um, so you can look at your POM data um, using that system. Okay. So how would you even know what kind of information should be collected? Well, what you have to do is you have to look at those nine factors. And one way that I always like to say to do that is really simply um, take nine pieces of paper, nine pieces of flip chart paper, nine pieces of poster board. On each one, write a different factor name. So you're going to have one flip chart or post it or whatever it is for rights, protection, and promotion. You're going to have one for dignity and respect and one for natural supports all the way through the nine factors. Okay? On each of those, as a group, write down what you already collect. Write down what you already document on, information you already collect, okay? For example, you know, for factor seven, which is staff resources and supports, you may already collect information on staff turnover or staff retention, okay? Additionally, if you are using the personal outcome measures, which we hope you would be, you can look at the different areas of the POM and see how they align with the different basic assurances. One example is up on the slide itself. Rights protection and promotion is factor one of the basic assurances, okay? Three specific areas of the POMs align with that, including people exercise rights, people are treated fairly, and people are respected. So if you collect POM data, you can use your POM data collected from one or all of those three areas to see how you are doing and how you monitor the area of factor one or rights protection and promotion. But again, remember for each organization, what is relevant and meaningful will vary. Okay? Every organization is different. It's going to vary based on the size. Okay, so an organization that supports less than 10 people might have different priorities of what they look at than an organization that supports 2,000. Another thing that will vary is based on the types of services that you provide. There are lots of different types of services that are out there. 24-hour supports versus employment supports, day supports, in-home supports, mental health supports, behavioral health, um, aging. Um, depending on the types of services you provide, that might look different um, to the types of data that are become your priorities or what's most relevant and meaningful to you. Your priorities as an organization. Okay, um, which hopefully relate to your mission, vision, and values. All the data that you collect, you want to align that back to your mission, vision, and values. What does our mission say? Who are we about? What are our values? What information and data that can we collect that align with what we say our values are? And of course, where you're at in your quality journey um, might also uh, kind of dictate um, you know, what is most important to you um, as far as the data that you collect. Okay? There's no wrong way to start. The goal is to just get started. Okay? Um, now, one thing that we do wanna make sure everybody understands is that CQL does not dictate the types of data or information you must monitor. We will often make suggestions, okay, give you recommendations. And of course, we'll want to see how POM data is included. But we do not set out a prescribed list of data points that you must collect and analyze related to each of the basic assurances factors. 
Now, I'm just going to give a few examples of types of data that you might take a look at. Okay. You might look at things um, like uh, rights assessments, or you might look at re representative payee info in the United States. You might look at rights restrictions or rights restorations. You might look at employment data for the people that you support, at concerns or complaints, or satisfaction survey data, or info from focus groups that you uh, that you host frequently. You might look at volunteer data, how you use volunteers, the number of volunteers, um, social roles that people have, or family satisfaction data. Other things that you might take a look at, data on trauma um, or abuse neglect, allegations um, of abuse, neglect, mistreatment, or exploitation. You might look at data from investigations that were completed. Um, and then of course, you're always looking at your incident management data, things like known and unknown um, injuries, um, death, uh, restrictive interventions, uh, things like that. You might look at, you know, the number of people that are involved in their healthcare supports. You probably, as many organizations do, look at medication errors if you provide those supports. You might look at hospitalizations, um, preventative healthcare data, um, medication use, uh, anything related uh, potentially to social determinants of health. You might look at information from safety reviews, both internal and external, from safety assessments. You might look at technology use, what kind of technology is being used with people that you support throughout your organization. You might also look at uh, information or data from disaster drills. Lots of times organizations uh, look at staff retention or training data. Uh, recruitment efforts, um, overtime and absenteeism. You might look at your hiring data, um, lag time, especially how long it, it's taking to hire uh, new employees. And of course, you might also look at employee satisfaction survey data if that is important to your organization. Lots of data around person-centered planning, you know, the attainment of goals, how people are involved in the planning process, behavior supports data, um, you know, looking at reduction in behavior supports, um, how many people use behavior supports potentially, psychotropic medication use, uh, including why psychotropic medications are provided, um, the diagnoses potentially of the people that you support to understand um, some people's needs, any kind of data around restraints or restrictive uh, interventions are, are things that are often looked at. And then of course, anything around social media, uh, finances, uh, record reviews, and again, technology use, um, it's all information that can be, could be valuable but again, depends on your organization, okay, where you are at, which takes us into efficiently collecting data. Now, I'm referring to probes 10B4 and 10B5 with this slide, okay? You can't force collection of data. We talked about already all kinds of different data points that you might collect or you might take a look at. Um, but you need to first determine the what, so what kind of information is most relevant and meaningful to your organization, because from there you'll need to determine how you're going to collect it and measure it. Okay. And you're going to want to make sure that any data you want to keep an eye on can easily be pulled together. Okay, You don't want to force it. So think of how any data point that you want to collect is documented. Is this through an electronic health record system, electronic reporting systems, committee minutes, uh, paper, uh, shared drives? Um, does that data or information have to be pulled manually or can it be tallied and aggregated automatically through a system in which it's documented? Okay. 
you have to consider how much time and effort it's going to take to pull the information that you need to review the data that you've identified as important. Okay. Again, as an organization, you might determine that the time spent compiling the information, it, it's, it, it's not matching to the value of the data you want to collect. And over time, that may change. But again, you want to start simple with your current systems available and then work towards maybe more sophisticated uh, data or methods of gathering the information. Okay. With the how of collecting the information that we talked about, okay, so how you're collecting the data, it's important to look at the how you're breaking it down. So if it's important to collect data on rights restrictions and you're collecting it through HRC meeting minutes or a spreadsheet, you will need to determine what you are looking at specifically in regards to rights restrictions, okay? So if you've identified that for factor one, you want to look at rights restrictions, okay? And you've identified that you're going to pull it from HRC meeting minutes. You, number one, might find that there is a more effective way to pull it, okay? Or you might determine that your HRC minutes are the best way to pull it, okay? But you'll want to understand when you're pulling that data, are you looking at the total number of restrictions, the types of restrictions, the average number per person? So depending on what specifically about that you're looking at, that may change how you want to compile and collect the data. So again, ask yourself, what is it specifically about this data that we want to know? Okay. Sometimes if the collection and compilation of the data is a struggle, you will need to simply rethink if it's worth it at that point in time. It may need to wait, and that's okay. Now, once you've determined what data will be collected okay, related to each of those nine factors and how it will be collected, then this is how your plan should be implemented. Okay? Remember your plan that Jackie talked about. It includes the what, the who, the when, the where, and the why. Okay, so again, the what is the data and information, okay? The who is the who will be collecting the information, as well as who will be reviewing the information. The when is when it will be collected, okay? As well as the when it will be reviewed, okay? The how often are we going to collect it and review it? Okay. You want to make sure that time frames, no matter what makes sense for you. Okay. Um, again, just remember that depending on a lot of variables of your organization and depending on the type of data, the collection and the review of it may it's going to look different and the time frame is going to look different. Okay. With that efficient collection of data, you want to ask the why. You want to analyze the information. So there's a number of probes just from the bullets on this slide that we're referring to. So with the analysis of the information, look at probes 10B5, 10B7, and 10A13. Sorry, I did go kind of backwards on that one. but. Um, you have to analyze your data. Otherwise, you're just collecting it. And how do you know that it's meaningful? Okay. Again, an initial analysis may be done by one person, but a full analysis shouldn't only be done by one person. What is learned from that analysis should be documented each time the data is reviewed. And remember, a good analysis is not simply a regurgitation of the numbers or the information. It's about asking the why. Why does the information look the way that it does? Why might it look different than the last time we looked at it? Because what you're doing from that analysis is you're looking for trends. You're going to develop goals to see what progress you're making. You're going to take action based on the analysis and trends that you're seeing. 
And of course, as Jackie's going to talk to us about, you're going to involve all perspectives because this will give you a more holistic, well-rounding understanding of what is really going on. Because ultimately, your goal is to turn data into information and information into insight. Such a wonderful statement by Carly Fiorini. Now, in order to really turn that information into insight, there's a few things that have to be done. You, you have to establish, as we talked about, how often the information is going to be reviewed. It has to be on an ongoing basis. It's not a one time a year thing, okay? Because you have to have a good sense of what progress is or is not being made uh, for those goals that you've made for yourself. And again, the frequency of those reviews is going to vary depending on those different variables that we talked about. Your priorities, the type of data, the structure of your organization, and the size of your organization. Okay. Um, lastly, before I let Jackie take over, um, 10B9 um, is where I'm, we're focusing on this one. And this is really about goals. Now, factor 10 focuses on continuous quality improvement. So there must be goals put in place because otherwise, how do we know that we're, we're getting anywhere with our data? How do we know that we're making progress? Okay. So Monitoring the goals is part of the, what we talked about with that ongoing review of data. Okay. Goals must be smart. I know many of you who have maybe worked as case managers before know this term. They must be specific and measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Okay. So just very quickly, Working off of the example on the slide, if our goal is to lose weight, like it is for so many, so many of us, our goal is to lose weight, but that's not very specific. So a specific goal would be to lose 20 pounds. Okay. How are we going to measure that? We have to note how we're going to measure it. Well, we're going to measure it by using a scale. We're going to measure it by documenting it in a fitness app. How are we going to know it's achievable? Well, one month probably isn't for 20 pounds, but maybe six months is. So how are we going to achieve this goal? That's our action steps. Okay, We're going to exercise um, you know, a certain number of minutes a week. We're going to drink a certain number of ounces of water every day, uh, whatever it may be. Okay, Relevant just goes back to why you chose that piece of data to begin with. Why is it a priority? And then, of course, it has to be time based. You have to have that time frame so you know how often you're looking at it and when you're trying to meet that goal. Lastly, keeping good documentation is important of the data analysis, the action steps, and the goals. Because, like Jackie's going to tell us, we want to be able to share all the good stories and all the good work that we're doing. Thank you, Liz. So now that we've collected and we've analyzed the data, how are you going to build your communication strategy to get meaningful information out to all of your stakeholders? I love this quote from Dan Heath. Data are just summaries of thousands of stories. Tell a few of those stories to help make the data meaningful. This is the goal for your communication strategy because there's so much power in stories. Building a communication strategy or a plan is the roadmap for the delivery of the information to all, which includes internal and external stakeholders. The strategy, the strategy should include answering the who, what, and how. It is an integral part of the policy for 10A. I will be referring some to 10A7 and 10A9 with this slide. The team should ask when developing the strategy, who's the audience? The first step in building the strategy includes knowing your audience. This involves all of the organization's stakeholders, the people supported, families, employees, board, committee members, 
um, other agencies and other community partners. What information are we going to share? Remember that it's important to know your audience and share only the most relatable data to the targeted audience. For instance, the board of directors may want to review like all areas monitored, whereas community partners would be more interested in just success stories. Think about different methods of sharing and levels of relevancy. It's best to include snippets of data and examples of action taken by the organization to enhance the supports and services. Make the data meaningful to your audience. Use storytelling to illustrate the meaning of the data Share by sharing success stories and then some of those celebrations of goals achieved. So here is where I would love to hear from all of you. What are some ways that you can think of that you can share information to your stakeholders? Please feel free to type in your examples in the Q&A box. Ways in which you can share information to your stakeholders. Oh, we're getting some good ones. Yay! The numbers keep going up. Liz, could you read a couple of those? Absolutely. Um, through email, annual reports, um, social media, um, developing webinars. Um, let's see. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Thanks, everyone. Websites, um, again, annual reports, stakeholder forums, newsletters. Um, monthly update meetings, compass meetings, um, nice. photos. Oh, I love that. Someone calls them delight sparks. Oh, um, annual it. reports. Oh, oh my gosh, there's so many. Board meetings, council meetings, quarterly magazines. Oh. Uh, Jackie, there's so many of them. I Yay. wish there was time. Yeah. Good, good, yep. good. Yep. So yeah, some of the major ones that we see is like a basic assurance quality management quarter corner on your website. You can also include a newsletter, social media blast, um, send a monthly email highlighting information. So what I would like to do next is um, just kind of show you highlight some areas, just some examples. So our fictitious building communities incorporated, there might be one out there somewhere, but um, Building Communities Incorporator wanted to kind of highlight some of the 2021 personal outcome measures data and share a success story of how organizational changes lead to positive growth in some of the people that they support's lives. So in 2021, their personal outcome measures data revealed that 55% of people interviewed, it, interviewed wanted to have more friends. The organization identified this as a priority and developed an action plan of identifying at least two individualized community life resources for each person um, supported. So then in 2022, the organization reviewed again their personal outcome measures data for the same people, and it, re it showed that there was a slight um, decrease in the amount of people that wanted to have more friends. Um, the organization wanted to celebrate by bringing to life this story, and Sarah, who is someone that was supported by the organization, came forth to tell her story, which was with the organization's support. She started attending a local yoga class once a week. So this slide just shows two examples of how um, Building Communities Incorporated relayed the information to all the stakeholders. Remember, when communicating the information to your stakeholders, you bring the quality journey full circle. There are a couple of CQL webinars that are coming up soon that um, might pique your interest, including three more sessions in our accreditation webinar series um, throughout the year. We'll, I think we're posting, I think Seth's posting the link um, in the chat box so you can read more about them and sign up. Um, we have a lot more um, different uh, additional resources around managing data and monitoring the basic assurances and integrating a quality management system. We have a lot of great resources on these subjects. 
And then you can also have valuable resources right at your fingertips by signing up for CQL um, emails. Check out the chat box for the link to sign up for these. And you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We regularly post a lot of resources, articles, and other information for human service providers. We also encourage you to join our e-community on Facebook where members share resources, ask questions, provide support, and identify solutions for common challenges. So here's our contact information. If you have any questions about our webinar today, um, we do have a little bit of time, I think maybe five minutes to answer questions. Not much time, but um, does anyone have any questions for us today? Uh, looks like we have one in the Q&A box, um, Jackie, so I'll, I'll read it and um, uh, we can answer this, but um, I think for this too, any examples that anybody else could share would be fantastic to, to help them out. Um, so somebody is looking for an example of a good process and or mechanism to track or integrate small day-to-day -day grievances. Um, this person says that they have a formal grievance process, but as mentioned um, in Factor 10, uh, specifically Pro B8, um, we're trying to find a good way to look at small grievances agency-wide. Um, any examples or thoughts on this? Well, I think my first thought is um, that this is simply a process that takes a lot of time to, to fully implement across an organization um, to get people to kind of uh, on the same page with, if you will. Um, there are different ways to do this sometimes, um, and, and really there's no one way, I think is what it comes down to. Um, it, it's You can have a shared document in a shared drive that, um, a, a good number of people can access and fill out with um, concerns as they hear them or complaints. But backing up from that, the first thing you have to do is define, um, you know, what that complaint or concern is that you would document on there. So almost creating a threshold of at what point does it come become a complaint that you would document on um, any kind of um, spreadsheet or just some place where you're compiling it all. Um, it looks like somebody said that they created a Google form for complaints and grievances. They said it's very helpful. Thank you so much for that. Another one looks um, at this through personal outcome measures, um, doing the interview every year for every person. Um, and they might reflect that in the POM process. Somebody else has a TIFI form, which I just love fun names for forms, um, which means trans transforming issues for future improvement. Oh, I just love that so much. So T-I-F-F-I -F -F -I form, okay? So it may be a form um, that um, anybody at any kind of position, DSP, people receiving services, whoever it is can fill out. Um, can be submitted, can be added to a spreadsheet or some other a document that's shared that anybody can add to, rather than every complaint or concern being emailed to a single person. Um, some people have created a, an email address where the concern or complaint can be specifically emailed to that email address. So complaints at the council.org, you know, or concerns at the council.org might be an email. Um, but again, it's, um, there shouldn't be any one way that you do it. And you have to first start by defining what the threshold is for what gets entered onto that form or into that, um, into that however you compile it. Um, somebody else says that they haven't done this yet, um, but another organization that they know uses SurveyMonkey for just random surveys. Um, specifically, they said rumors, crazy house rules, et cetera. Um, that's great. Just randomly putting in there, uh, you know, things that are going on uh, that you want to know about. 
Um, of course, if you have more questions about this or maybe don't feel that we got that fully answered or even just want to chat about it more, uh, feel free to use Jackie and I's email address um, and reach out and we're more than happy to, uh, to share uh, with you other things, other ways that we've learned that this is being done. So uh, I think we're just about our, at our time. So Seth, uh, throw it back to you, Jackie, if there's anything you want yeah. to add please. <laughs> so. I <laughs> know a wonderful webinar. We really appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. And as Jackie had mentioned earlier, we do have three more sessions in our accreditation webinar series. Those are posted into the chat box of this uh, Zoom chat window. Other than that, we will be following up with attendees in a roughly one to two weeks with an email that'll include a link to a PDF version of the PowerPoint slides as well as the webinar recording. We'll also include links there for registering for the, the upcoming three webinars in this series. But uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you, Elizabeth and Jacqueline, for, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you all.